me introduce myself first. My name is Dirk Reetman. I work with Philips Healthcare. I have been working with Philips already for a very long time. Actually, for this occasion, I looked it up. I worked with Philips uh, since 1993. I joined Philips in July 1st, 1993. So I'm with the company already for a very long time. I have had different positions within the company. Uh, before I joined the company, I actually did my PhD in Leiden University in the Kamerling Oost Laboratory. So I actually have been working in the low temperature physics lab there. I did NMR experiments on high GC superconductors. Uh, even though those were high GC superconductors, all the experiments that we did were 4 Kelvin and below. Uh, we did a lot of work between 0.3 Kelvin and 4.2 Kelvin. And it was a very amazing time because the Kamenos Laboratory, obviously, is the laboratory where superconductivity was discovered in 1911. We were still operating some of those very early cryostats. So it's, it's amazing to, to see that you're working with those glass cryostats, where you can actually see the lander itself and see readings that are spilling out of those pipelines. So it was very interesting to not have a metal cryostat where there's something magic happening, but we were seeing the, the, true, the true thing of, of liquid helium. Those times on, on high GC superconductivity, uh, we did a lot of theoretical work laboratory. Um, I, I spent some time with a Russian postdoc on, uh, on looking into, in particular, the underlying mechanism of high GC superconductivity. And we thought that we had the clue of high GC superconductivity, what's called bipolar. Mm -hmm. So unlike the ordinary superpairs, which are kind of distributed in the ladders, bipolarons are very localized. And we thought that to get a bipolaron, which was basically also a zero spin pair, um, that was causing the superconductivity. And lo and behold, we could actually predict the NMR properties based on that theory. So we were kind of feeling very proud of us. We saw ourselves already some of those coming up, well-dressed in the northern part of Scandinavia. <laughs> but I can tell you the fact that I'm standing here and became a manager uh, <laughs> tells a different story. Today I work in the MR industry. Uh, I joined recently, about a year ago, the facility that we have here in Latham, uh, building superconducting super MR, mag uh, MR magnets. I think that most of you that have joined the tour yesterday have the opportunity <coughs> to see some of our factory. <coughs> uh, that's the place where we are, um, and that's the place where we build those magnets. We are the only supplier within Philips supplying the uh, superconducting magnets to our MR industry. So with that said about myself, uh, I think it's time to introduce the panel. Uh, we have Ramesh. Uh, Ramesh is going to say something about our IT speed activities that we have ongoing in the world. Um, we will have uh, Drew, and Drew will follow up to different perspectives of industry exports. Then we'll have Sandra Reed say something about the brutal truth of all day life and superconductivity. Then we'll follow with Luca. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to present the, what we have been doing here. I'm Ramesh Gupta. I, I did STL Planet R&D from my textbook on National Lab. The STL Lab down in Long Island. And uh, there we have <coughs> long tunnel, 3.8 kilometer tunnel, filled with water vacuum tank. So there are some other applications of superconductivity besides MRI. Many accelerators, most highly distributed and distributed accelerators, will use superconducting magnets to come for the ground And uh, th there are two rings of that actually in that tunnel. So there are a lot of superconducting magnets used there. From last decade, I'm working more on HTF magnets, the high temperature superconductors, uh, which uh, are made by the uh, power here. And that's very essential to the work which we are doing. Because it gives us two unique opportunities. One, as you all know, that they can operate at much higher temperature. So the, 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 the difficulties or the challenges we are talking about helium, and 
not this step. You can either work at nitrogen or you can work with sulfur in a completely closed environment or no. So, so you don't have to have that problem. The other unique opportunity it creates is that you can go to very high field magnets, 25 tesla or more, which are not possible with the, with the low temperature conversion alternative we have. In fact, at UK, one we have made a magnet recently which went to 16 tesla or SPS. So that, that shows that now we are moving from small demonstration superconductor where you have a few meters of tape and converting them. They are available in long length that you can make real devices, high speed devices. So that is the demonstration. We are very excited about it. And we are looking more in that direction. We have a program, our Paiz match program, which was mentioned in the mor morning. And there we are talking about uh, 24 Tesla magnets or SPS. So that's another exciting thing. We are very excited about that. And again, in that we use the conductor for superpower. It's very important for the conductor to have a good mechanical property. And uh, then we, so these are the future, but already what we are finding that we are using SPS magnets in real application. We have a <coughs> energy recovery lena at UK1. In that, we are using SPS magnets. What you have there, you have a superconducting cavity, which operates at 2K, and then from there you move to room temperature. There is no space to put any magnets. So you cannot put SPS magnets because the temperature is not high enough. So what we did right on the top of that fellow, where you are transitioning from 2K to room temperature, so the area where the temperature is going to be 30K, we put SPS, and that provided unique solution. We could not have done that with anything else. If you put uh, MPS, there is no strong low temperature. If you put copper, there is so much heat generated that the whole system will change. So already we are finding that it's not only a thing of future, it is something which we are using now, which provides unique solution. And uh, then, then there are facilities which are coming up, near future, like uh, this one in Michigan State facility of rare isoprotein, there we create uh, very intense beams by taking, say, 500 kilowatt of proton. It hits the target, it creates a lot of energy. It creates a lot of isotopes. We select one particular isotope, but most of rest, as it goes through the beam line, but rest are going and hitting the magnet. A lot of energy there. You can't work there with low temperature superconductor because they can't deal with that kind of energy there. So it provides what we see as that SPS provides a unique solution and we are using them today. Now, of course, the, the, the number of solutions will increase as the price goes down, but in some application, if you look at the total cost, not the superconductor cost, but the total cost of the system, you actually come out ahead. So what I'm finding that, yes, there will be many more applications, but already today, we are finding that SPS is providing uh, us with enabling technology a solution where the system cost goes down. So I would be looking forward to discussing more of them. And what I find application of the magnets which we are building for RPI's mesh, which is a 25 Tesla, that again, I come from, from the Africa community, particle physics community. There we need magnets which are 20, 30 to 40 Tesla, even higher speed. Now that application you can use in NMR, because in NMR also you need high speed NMR, those kind of magnets, 25, 30 Tesla. So I would be glad to discuss in that area any question you have, but I think there's a very good future here, and we already are finding use for that. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the sponsors for uh, inviting me here. And uh, I'm Drew Hazelton. I'm a principal engineer with applications at Superpower. And in the applications group, we really look at enabling PGHTS and different dem demonstration devices to really promote the adoption rate uh, into the markets that are developing. Uh, we've worked on many projects. Uh, there was the Auburn Cable project that was mentioned this morning. Uh, the Sumitomo VOC uh, free support from DOE and ICERDA. Uh, worked on multiple transformer projects, uh, chiefly with uh, S SPS, uh, what's called Waukesha Electric. Started just before uh, 2000, a uh, one MBA unit. Uh, we then did a five MBA unit. We're currently working on a 28 MBA transformer with uh, pulsar aiming function. Um, there's the two SNES projects that we're involved with, uh, the one with Arthur D that uh, Lynette uh, just commented on. Uh, the 
that's also transitioning into one that's uh, funded by the Army Research Lab, really taking what we've learned, uh, developing SNES for the new multi facility, and ad adopting it for um, use in the uh, military tactical microgrid, which has a whole different voltage requirements than what you have with the utility. Uh, we've done a lot of SCL development over the years, and a lot of what we've learned working in FCL has uh, fed back into our materials <coughs> development and uh, has led us to successfully uh, supply materials to several different FCL manufacturers, uh, including Applied Materials and Variant, which we're very excited to work with uh, with this new uh, installation in, uh, down in Poughkeepsie. Uh, we work with our customers to really, what's the best way to use our conductor? How can we adapt our conductor to the different uh, operating environments for the different devices? Um, as we look into health and science and research, uh, the PG really enables very high field magnets that you can't do with LTS. Um, you know, NMR spectroscopy, uh, LTS will lead us to about 20 tesla. You know, now you're talking 25, 30 tesla. Uh, there's a current project at MIT looking at 1.3 gigahertz, which you could not do with LTS. Uh, high energy physics, um, you know, there's the muon collider that's being discussed, looking soon to Tesla, 50 Tesla with uh, HTS, something you couldn't conceive with, with LTS. Um, and Renette has a lot of experience with different uh, other high energy physics uh, applications. It's also that ability to operate at higher temperatures, 20 Kelvin, 30 Kelvin, where you can optimize the, the current density you can get with HTS, and you can um, couple that with uh, pretty good cryogenics in the 20 to 30 Kelvin range. Um, generators for wind turbines are uh, a hot topic that people are working on. That. MRI uh, for the target precision or alien Todd. Um, as you go to very high field MRI, maybe seven Tesla and above, uh, HTS could be used with uh, Niagara skin, um, potentially, particularly if we can get the properties up and the, and the parts down. Uh, also, heat pumps. <coughs> we've improved that. Uh, we're making steady progress in that area. And also, High field magnets. Uh, there's a 32 magnet project, a 32 Tesla magnet project down at NHMSL, which we're highly involved in. And again, that's enabled by the availability of PG HTS. So we're very open to working with uh, many customers, very different areas. Uh, high field magnets, uh, to low field magnets, uh, transformers, you know, 0.1 Tesla. Uh, HTS has. Uh, we do it, you know, we make small improvements in keeping it persistent, in keeping it cold, in making it bigger, making it shorter, making it cheaper, making it cheaper, making it cheaper. The technology hasn't changed very much, and many of the people who were here in these earlier panels talked about, well, you take what we learned from MRI, you take what we learned from MRI. Um, so if you want reliability data, we've got it. We've got systems in the field that have 25 year plus years of daily operation. 
Um, but if you want me to tell you that your cryophobia is going to get better, forget it. The more installed base you have, the bigger your cryophobia gets. Because nothing makes a, a cryo, excuse me, refrigeration system, let me see if you know what that means, nothing makes a refrigeration system fail like interaction with human beings. You have a customer who says, oh, hey, I want to save electricity. I'm going to turn this off overnight. Why did my magnet quench? And again, you, your refrigeration system is only as reliable as its support system. So you have more things fail because you've got particles in your water that's supposed to keep the compressor cool, or the room gets too hot, um, or some type of human interaction with the system. I didn't ground it. I didn't um, properly isolate the emergency button and some nurse leaned up against it. When the customer doesn't care about those things. The customer doesn't care that your system is superconducting. As Wolfgang put it this morning, what made MRI fail? Wow, you could make an image that you can't get any other way. That's all they care about. And they want to be able to do that day in, day out, regardless of anything else. So when you start to talk about the cryogenic systems for power grids and cryogenic systems for supercomputing, the wow factor wears off really quick. And all that really matters is can you deliver consistent performance in, in scenarios that you never possibly could have imagined? And even if you didn't imagine a 14-foot wall of salt water crashing over lower Manhattan, still your fault that the high-end electronics that controlled your power grid failed and you couldn't get them back up and running in 24 hours. Or if you want a more dramatic example, look at the poor guys out in TEPCO who, uh, you know, an earthquake that moved South America two inches and they, uh, their plant melted down and it's their fault that they didn't imagine that that would be coupled with a giant tsunami. These are the realities of the industry that we face, that we can build it, we can build it better, we can build it cheaper, and we can make it 99.99% reliable. And in the end, we will be blamed for whatever failures that there happen to be. And those failures come for interaction with our systems with the rest of the world. So we have to start working with the sites where these are installed to make sure that the water is clean and pure, and um, that the electricity is available, or that our systems can handle that. And as we're going out there helping one another, we can help to say, these are the lessons that I've learned. These are the failure points that I have. Um, maybe these will help you, maybe they won't. Anybody wants to design a non-magnetic floor buffer for cleaning hospital floors, please talk to me afterwards. Because my single greatest cause of a quench in a magnet in an MRI is the cleaning crew. And I bet you didn't know that. <laughs> so how's GE doing on that non-magnetic floor buffer?
build systems from the ground up. We test out new applications, new ideas, new technology, new products. And then whatever sticks, whatever works, whatever has a successful test in this field and meets market potential gets translated into healthcare or you know, productization and commercialization. Some examples Slide refers to how there were many 
Okay. Um, so, uh, Luca in particular. Um, in terms of field strength, um, I mean, we see everything is one and a half two standard, three two. Then you have the seven two system, so you have RF problems. Where do you think in the future uh, we're heading in terms of field strength? And let's take out for a little bit the economics involved in 7T and stuff. But where is the optimal for different areas that you, you believe we might want to be if we had the technology that was not so expensive? Once that approval was granted, now it's limited enough to one and a half Tesla and three Tesla for clinical images, like Luca was saying. Um, and it's not just the US federal government, it's multiple governments worldwide who say, these are the fields at which you will operate, these are the fields at which these things are certified. Do you know if um, you can have an all plastic catheter that has nothing to do with magnetic field, no metal bits in it at all, that's certified for one and a half Tesla a week? can't use it with three Tesla because the government says no. So that in and of itself, even more so than cost, can end up being a driver for what 
be utilized. But it's also like these the best pictures ever that the US federal government says it's not clinical, it's not considered um, feasible as only a research magnet. yesterday we talked a little bit about that in Philip's involvement, but more so if you start examining the patent literature, you will see that every possible combination of MR guided anything has been discussed in the, I think there's a lot of physicians who would really appreciate that kind of capability out there. Um, if you run into problems with length of scan time, you don't want to cook your patients, as Richard's alluded to several times. You don't want to also want to cook your physicians. They complain more. Um, outside the US, patients don't sue, doctors do. I'm thinking more uh, not so much of MR uh, image guidance, but of magnetic guidance itself, like the stereotactic type of uh, guidance. Yeah, uh, we've worked with a, a customer, uh, Dan Sadiq, uh, on using uh, HDS for
So there is some development work out there uh, looking at these uh, alternative methods for developing the magnetic field to these uh, city sources. All of the three major players would tell you that one of the, the things that keep our management up at night is the use availability of liquid helium. And more importantly, in the countries that are now the major part of our market, the cost. It only makes $25 a liter plus in, in China. Um, if you can get it at all, it's almost impossible to get liquid helium in Greece. It's, it was sourced there. Um, the, again, the gold standard is to have a magnet that doesn't use expensive parts. We don't care what technology we settle on, but if we can make it cheaper and make it more reliable, we'll do it. And cryo-free is certainly one of the options that we're all pursuing for that. several approaches that have been uh, still in development. Um, <coughs> quench in an HTS magnet is totally different than LTS. Uh, very difficult to propagate. Um, it really looking at, and there's been a lot of good work done down at Brookhaven, looking at detecting the, the pre-quench condition. Uh, a lot of voltage taps. HTS is so stable, it's extremely difficult to propagate a quench, uh, especially thermally, uh, in, a, in an HTS magnet as compared to an LTS magnet. So uh, some of the work we had a, a generator project uh, funded by LNR where we looked at really understanding this pre-quench condition and how to identify it. whether it's really quench kind of thing or it's just noise detection. And after that, kicking the energy out, out of the convention to let energy not be there. And or, or picking up somewhere, some of the, I cannot discuss because they are mm -hmm. but, but kicking the energy out from that mid point, <coughs> not allowing it to go there. And in that point trick, you can drop up to it some energy. You need to see whether you can keep
price hopefully will go down, but the, the, the availability of helium and, 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 and thinking of MRI and other, facility, other facility, medical facilities, uh, <coughs> chromotherapy or whatever, which need helium, HPS can take away from that. So, 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 so therefore, I think developing HPS magnet for MRI or other reasons would be, would be quite Time that HPS is very expensive, just to be expensive. But if you look at the <coughs> overall cost structure of the magnet, sometimes the connector cost is, is with NPS it is 3%, depending on the application, of course. With HPS it may be 10%. So you spend more on the conductor. But the cryogenic becomes so simpler. You can allow much more heat flows and things like that. It becomes you have a very large temperature margin. So if, if someone forgot to someone turn off the lights. In the evening, well, it, 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 it still may be superconducting in the morning because we have such a big temperature margin. So those kind of things create very unique situations where there may be some possibilities. I think with um, MRI, um, I know the prize going to be around for a long time. Uh, it's such an easy material to use, low cost. might be a different question than healthcare in general. Um, I think if you've ever been to Puerto Rico, if you drive from San Juan to Allende National Forest, you go by Popeye's, 
Church's Chicken, MRI Clinic, McDonald's, MRI Clinic, Burger King, Church's Chicken, MRI Clinic. The compensation, which, okay, they might be all related, but the, uh, the healthcare compensation protocol that you have in a given geographical area will drive the nature of the healthcare that you can receive. Um, in some parts of the world, there are twice as many MRIs for people as we have here in the US. They're, they focus on the low-end ones. They're readily available to everybody, and, and the cost per customer is cheap. Here we, um, we focus on technologies that are much more high-end, and we're constantly bringing out new technologies. The new technologies tend to be more expensive, but we sell services based on the latest and greatest, best and, and brightest models. Um, so I think that what you'll find over the future is that you'll start to see some more divergence in magnet-driven healthcare between the various parts of the world. I think that uh, it will become more and more of a locally specialized market in terms of what we think. You've got people here in the United States talking about them selling MRIs for vet clinics for small animals. And I don't see that happening necessarily in, let's say, Saudi Arabia. one can imagine such a system and work on developing it, the market is huge for it. And what it would enable a much more accurate diagnosis is enormous. Today you do have expensive MRIs, and so there's some movement towards these specialized systems, but many more parts of the body can benefit from such systems. So that's where I see things going eventually. 
the other comment I want to make is about the education in particular. It's, it's, a, it's a remarkable to think about how vertically integrated all the industries needed for yeah. MR and many other superconductivity applications are in the United States. There are national labs, multinational companies, small companies. Are they going to work with each other by themselves? No. It's going to require some catalyst. Perhaps the state can be the catalyst or some other catalyst source. If that catalyst is, uh, is developed or is, is produced, you have the, the ingredients for some really remarkable innovation that will revolutionize MRI for the whole world. And it can be done here in the United States. So I know it's a bit <laughs> repetitive here or so, but uh, <laughs> we, need, we need the catalyst. Very good. Is there any vision in the audience? I know. Um, any of your thoughts on uh, MR has typically been um, diagnostic as opposed to therapeutic. I think from that point of view, uh, comments on going towards the more therapeutic side. Um, I know there's a lot of work on it. major manufacturers of MRIs have MRIs in, in the most bizarre places you could possibly imagine. Um, Philips has an MRI installed on the Bagram Air Force Base in Kandahar. Um, there are, yes, there are sensitivities to power quality in anything that runs on electricity, um, but the technology is not new, and the power industry certainly has developed the capability for the, us to deal with tools and techniques that can create what we want. Um, the only thing you can't really compensate for is the total absence of electricity. Um, it's 
and it gets back to you when you take it as a chilled water for my compressor. Um, MRI, any superconducting technology is hostage to being able to be kept cold.
that usually as you just heard, are such at such uh, uh, close to the precise time when they develop. They have to have the authorization to actually develop something at a certain edge. So it has to be uh, supported enough by the by the catalyzers that, that work for it to actually ensure participation from all the actors. It has to be an MR system developed for this preferably too has to be part of it. I assume all the smaller players would be more than happy to participate. Mm -hmm. um, some bump sharing is always desired by, by the state funding, etc. But it's not clear that initially that would be the right thing. Maybe a study and uh, uh, including intellectual property agreements so that everybody has access to it in the early stage. Those are going to be indispensable to make it happen. So there has to be some creativity on the part of the catalyzers to be sensitive to those conditions, make sure they are there. And then there has to be some inspiration that this is what we want to do. And we're gonna, we're gonna make sure we do it. We have to have a champion of some kind to push this catalyst forward. Yeah. the answer was in the last panel. Um, every hospital has a substation. That's not even a large portion of the substation. I can get a fault current limiter in every substation and by economies of scale, the collaborative technology that supports my MRI is going to drop off. The cost of the HTX inductor that can make a far cheaper <coughs> MRI, or at least one that's far more stable, will drop off. I think that what will help us is not necessarily anything that we can do ourselves or that we are doing ourselves. Um, the MRI market isn't going to increase tenfold. You know, we're, you know, can we poach customers from one another and, you know, drive from three to two to one and drive GE down, maybe. Um, but we're not going to all of a sudden start making a ton of standard of MRIs that can take it we're making right now. We've already saturated the first world and we're just holding steady. We want economies of scale. We need the energy, energy applications and the computing applications to start driving down the cost in some of those technologies. And let's be honest here, we all know that um, the three of us use the same, um, same um, refrigeration system manufacturer. There's only one major player in the MRI refrigeration system world, isn't it? That's not Cisco. And I want persistent friends in HTX. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> I, I think, you know, the theme we've heard all today is, you know, partnership. And, uh, you know, we do best working with customers and partners and, you know, end users. Um, we 
know we have to get costs down. We know we have to get fee plans up. We have to get quality better. Uh, it's being driven by the end user. Um, it, it's important. Um, there are certain applications that are enabled by PG that are less price sensitive, but in the end, they all need solution could be useful to you, not the entire system, but exact a small segment of the solution. So I think beauty is to talk about the beauty privacy. It will be very good to visit each other and we say for the first time beauty and they and, 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 and Philips. I've been here for about 30 years, so we need to <laughs> so we need to see that. But as, as if agriculture needs some lab, we are more open to collaboration. And we have research drives us to look for Some of them may not be so stupid and may be useful to you. So I would, uh, I, I want to thank organizers for, for, for organizing this, but I would really like to see more what we have been talking.
Thank you.